let's create a gamut assembler on our Commodore 64. To get started, we're going to spec out what we are going to write. We're going to spec it out using our old friend's speed script. This is a word processor I haven't used since middle school. Uh, brings back some, some pretty good memories. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to use this tool to write out our, our project plan. So the game we're going to create is going to be called Copycat. So we're going to start with the minimal viable product. And what I mean by that is the core gets the game and the least we could do to call it a game. Because once we have that up and running, then we can build everything else around it. And things like scoring and, and, and graphics and user interface, we're all going to build that afterwards. But we're going to build the very, very core of the game first. So what is the core of the game going to be? So the game is going to start and it's going to create a pattern of 20 random notes. Uh, there will be four different musical notes that will be used in this pattern. Okay, so the game will be played in rounds starting at one. Okay, the game will play round notes to the player, meaning on round one, the game will play one note. Okay, on round two, it will be two notes of the same pattern. The play will then need to repeat those notes back to the game. Okay. If the player gets it correct, we go to the next round, and then it repeats. If the player gets any note wrong, the game ends. So what tools do we need right away? Well, we need an assembler. So for this, we're going to use Turbo Macro Pro. What I mean by create Turbo Macro Pro, we're going to use the configuration utility in it to create our own custom version for this project. If you don't know what that means, check out my video on Turbo Macro Pro. Uh, or just watch and watch us go through the process. It's really neat. Let's think of the code we will need. Being that it's a game and we're playing notes, we're going to need a routine that uh, performs some kind of delay. We would then need to create some common macros that will be useful throughout writing the other code in this project. I think we would need some kind of poke macro where I can pass it an address and a value. We'll probably need a, um, a way to print text. And then a macro to poke uh, address value for a number of bytes. And that'll be useful for what we need to set blocks in memory. So then we're probably going to need some sound routines, right? So I'll just leave that there. We'll, we'll figure that out when we get to it. And then we're going to need something to manage the game state. So I think this is a pretty good start, and we'll see where it takes us. Let's save this, and let's get started with the first few steps. All right, so let's first create our copy of Turbo Macro Pro. We do that by loading this program here. So this program lets us configure it and then save a copy of it by itself to our blank disk so we can use it to write code. So I like to set the background color to a different color for, uh, for each project they work on. And we do that by pressing uh, what I call the command key. It's really that left arrow key. So we're going to press command key, and then the C, and then I type a zero. And I'm going to use, um, I think, Commodore 4 because it's a pretty good gray background. On the screen, it says back arrow plus C. Normally, you think of that like Control C, where you press both at the same time. In Turbo Macro Pro, you press the first key, you wait a second, and then you press the second key. So, just so it's clear on how that works. So if I use Command Asterisk, I can get a directory listing. That file right there that starts with TMP and has a bunch of spaces after it, version 1.2, that's the one we're going to make a copy of. That's the one that does not need any special hardware. It just works on a stock Commodore 64. So first we have to load that one in by using Command and L. Make sure you put a space here or you'll get the wrong one. This does take a while to load in. We're going to choose no because we've already set our color here. So now we put our blank project disk in, which at this point in time, old has a speed script and that notes file we created. Let's command then asterisk to see a directory to make sure we have the right disk. 
and there it is. And now we're gonna use Command S to save it. And I'm just gonna call it TMP. Okay, let's restart our computer and let's start coding. All right, let's load up our copy of Turbo Macro Pro. And let's write a delay routine. So we're gonna create a subroutine. We're gonna call it delay. And we're, we wanna pass into it a value in the accumulator. And we want that value to be how long we're gonna wait. And that quantity is gonna be in count of one sixtieth of a second. Okay, we're gonna create a block of code. When we create subroutine, that's very important to wrap what you possibly can in a block and a B end opcode. This will uh, prevent any labels that we create in between these two from being visible outside of that block. And that's really important because as we're gonna create lots of loops in our code, we don't want the assembler to confuse our loop label with other loop labels. But before we get into that, how are we going to implement this? We're going to use the Jiffy clock. The Jiffy clock is a counter in the Commodore 64 that ticks up every one sixtieth of a second. It's a 24-bit number, so it's three bytes wide. So it ticks up for quite a while. Um, and the memory addresses that we can find this at are $A00 through $A2. Okay, so each one of these contains a portion of that 24-bit number. This first one contains the highest part of it. This contains the middlest part of it. This contains the lowest part of it. Now you'll also notice that they are all in that what's called the zero page. So anything is, any memory address that starts with dollar zero zero is the zero page. And we can refer to it just by the, the last two hex digits of the memory address. So what happens is while the computer um, is running, like I said, every sixth of a second, this value ticks up. Eventually it gets to FF and then when it rolls over, it rolls to zero, zero, and the overflow goes to the byte to the left of it. Well, we don't really care for the amount of time that we need to track these memory addresses. So we're only gonna look at the value in A2. The plan of attack is, is we're gonna take the accumulator, we're gonna add it to the current value of A2. So let's pretend that the value is 10 when we read it, and the user passed in an accumulator of 10, right? We're gonna add that together and we get 20. And then we're gonna write a loop that waits for A2 to get to 20. And that's how we're gonna pause. So let's do that. So we're gonna do a CLC that clears the carry flag in the CPU. It's very important to do that before you add numbers because if you don't, you might accidentally add in another number. As you can see from the add with carry instruction here, what it does is it takes the accumulator plus memory plus the carry flag value and stores it in the accumulator. Uh, so now we're gonna add to the accumulator the value in A2, okay? And you'll see it's using the zero page addressing mode and it's gonna bring in the carry flag, which is zero because we set it to zero and store it in the accumulator. So now we're all ready to wait. So now we're gonna create a loop and we're gonna compare the value in the accumulator with the current value in the Jiffy clock. All right, when those two values are equal, the compare operator is going to set the Z flag in the CPU. And then we're gonna be able to use B and E, which will branch when a Z flag is not set, uh, meaning it's not zero, it'll go into a loop. So once those values are equal, it'll fall through. And the next command will be RTS to return from subroutine. Okay, let's uh, run us through the assembler and we see there's no errors. Uh, and just an interesting thing to point out about Turbo Macro Pro, we have not told this assembler where we want to assemble our code into memory. And if you don't, it defaults to $1,000, which is perfectly fine for us, uh, but just an interesting note. Okay, so we wanna write some test code here to make sure that our routine works. All right, so we're gonna have our delay uh, test all right, 
So here we're going to write a traditional program, star equals dollar one thousand. As you saw, we could technically skip that, but it's always good to be very clear what we're doing here. We're going to write a loop, and we're going to increment do twenty. This is going to change the border color to whatever it is now plus one. So it's kind of neat. Um, and because we're writing into the vic chip, it'll just by writing a new value there, the border will will instantly change. Uh, we're going to load in 60, because that's 60, 60 times a second, so that should be one second of time. We're going to call our function delay, okay? Um, and then we're going to JSR over to $FFE4. This is a subroutine built into the kernel of the Commodore 64, and it is called get in, and it gets a character from the keyboard. If it finds a value in the keyboard, it'll put it into the accumulator. If not, it will set the accumulator to zero. Well, as we knew from earlier, if we set the accumulator to zero, the Z flag is set. So what we can do now is we can branch, if the Z flag is set, meaning nothing was typed in, we got a zero back, uh, to the loop. So it will change the border color, wait a second, change it, wait a second, until one of us press a key. And then we're gonna do an RTS. Before we run this, we're going to want to save this. Um, we want to call this file just delay. Okay, so we're going to save this now. To run this, I'm pressing Command, again, the back arrow, and 3. And it assembled. And I press S, and I can run my code right away. And that seems to be about a second and we're gonna press a key to end it. Okay, after we run our program, it drops us in basic, and we're gonna type sys32768 to get back into Turbo Macro Pro. So now we have a test routine for a function. In Turbo Macro Pro, when you save source code, it stores it as PRG files. So we're gonna use command and asterisk to view the disk so we can, so we can see this. So here we've got our speed script, we've got our notes, TMP is to macro pro. Delay, even though it says it's a PRG, is really your source code stored in a, like a kind of sort of compressed uh, format. And there's actually some other things stored in that. I think it stores like if we do bookmarks and things like that for, for convenience. Um, but what we want to do is we want to take this subroutine we have here and save it out to a file that we can consume in other programs. So one thing we need to do to our delay program really quickly is add a dot end at the bottom. So we put a dot end at the bottom here because sometimes Turbo Pro will cause some problems if you try to do things that go to the very bottom of the file. So we want to take this part here and save it to an external file because that's the part we want to include into our main program. We want to keep the test code up, up above but we're going to use this bottom part to include into other programs. So what you do is you press Command, M, S, and this is kind of how we mark a block of text. And we're going to move our cursor right above this dot end, and then do a Command, M, E, and you can see that it highlighted it gray. Now we're going to do Command, B for block, and we're going to use the W version of this block. So W writes it out to a file, just the block of text that we pulled in. And we're going to call that delay.s. The dot s will stand for subroutine. Now if we look at the director using command star, so again that's back arrow star. You could see we have got delay, that's our code that we have here with our test routine on it. And then delay.s, which is going to be a sequential file that we're going to use later to import into our main code. If you use uh, command exclamation point, we can view that file on a disk. And in that file, you can see it's just the routine. All right, so now we've written our delay routine. All right, let's create some macros. We're going to clear our editor and work on a new file. So we're going to do left arrow C. That's going to ask us to cold start. We're going to press yes. And now we're going to create three macros. We're going to create a poke to simulate the poke command in basic so we can set a value in memory in one short line of code. We're going to make a set mem macro that's going to let us set a block of memory, and we're going to create a print macro so we can print text quite easily. So let's start with a poke macro. So poke, it's a macro. 
going to take an address and a value. So we're going to load into the accumulator the second parameter. And you use an English pound 2 to reference the second parameter, in which this case will be the address. Let me move this over a bit here. And then we're going to store that value into the first parameter. And there's our poke macro, very straightforward. We're going to do a set and mem macro. This is going to take uh, an address, a value, and a quantity. So it's just like poke, except it's going to do it for that many uh, bytes of memory. So just like poke, we're going to load into the accumulator the second parameter, which is value. Now we're going to load into the X register, the quantity. And that's in a third parameter. We're going to start a loop. And we're going to start by decrementing X by 1. So if you passed in a 5, we want to fill in bytes. We want to fill in addresses plus 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 to give us 5 bytes. So we're going to decrement it to go down to 4. We're going to store this at the parameter 1, comma X, meaning the memory just passed in plus X because we're kind of going backwards, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Uh, because the X register could turn into a 0 when it's decremented, it could set our Z flag. And with that knowledge, we can branch if the Z flag is not set back to loop. So if this is not 0, it'll continue on. The last mark we want to have is printing text. And we want this to work by passing in the address of a string that's 0 terminate. We're going to use basic to do this. Basic has a function at AB1E that we can wire into that if we set the low byte of the address in the accumulator and the high byte in the Y index, when we call it, it'll print us the text just like basic does. So we do that with loading the accumulator with a low byte of parameter 1. Load the Y index register with the high byte of parameter 1. And then we call basic at AB1E to do the work for us. And those are the three macros. So we're going to put these into a file when we're done called common.m. And this will be the file that we can include into our game. So now we'll try some test code for this. I'm pressing back arrow 2 to get these lines. All right. So we're going to have our code start at memory just 1,000. And we'll just do some simple poke commands to set um, some colors on the screen so we know it works. We'll set the border to red, set the background to black, and we'll set the cursor to white. So let's save this real quick. So left arrow S. We want to call our code common. And again, this is going to contain the test code and the actual code for the macros. And we should be able to assemble this. And we should be able to drop the basic and run it. And it works. Okay, let's test that text command out. So we're going to do txt. And we're going to use the dot null directive, which Turbo Macro Pro uh, knows that whatever's in quotes, we'll put hello world, will end with a zero. So in memory, it'll put a zero at the end, but we don't have to key this in. And then we'll do a second line to make sure that it works for different memory addresses. And we'll say, how are you? But we're going to put this on a second line, because normally when you call that basic routine, when you call it again, it just continues where it left off. So if I press left arrow A, it puts me uh, in a mode like in basic when you press quote and you can enter screen commands. We're going to press shift enter to enter the carriage return. And then we're going to press command to get out of this mode. All right. Then um, we want to move our RTS up here. And now we're going to call um, our print function to print this out. So we can print text and we can print txt2. All right, so let's save this. Let's assemble it. Assembled. Left arrow one to get the basic and let's run it. And it works. Fantastic. The last piece of the puzzle is the set memory. So we're going to create a block of memory called clear me. We'll make some bytes here, and we're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8, 9, 10. There we go. And to test this, we're going to call set mem, pass and clear me. We're going to set the values to 0, and we set the first five of these to 0. So we're going to set this through here to 0. 
Now, how are we going to test this? We have to test this in a machine language monitor. So let's first uh, assemble this. And instead of running it, we're going to assemble this to an object file so we can load it into a monitor. And we do that with left arrow 5. And we're going to use common dollar sign 1000. Excellent. Okay, let's go get ourselves a monitor. Okay, I've just attached a second drive to the machine or to a virtual machine. And in that drive, I put in the Commodore 1541 demo disc. This is the disc that comes with the disc drive when you buy it. And on this disk is a program called Unicopy. This will let us copy a monitor off of another disk I have onto our project disk. All right, we're going to copy from drive 9 to drive 8. And I'm going to change the disk in drive 9 to my disk, which contains the Commodore Macro Assembler Developer System. We're going to type in monitor star. There's two monitors on a disk. We want the one with $8,000. So we're going to press Y. And we're going to press N for that one. We are not going to format our project disk. That would not be a great idea. Nope. All right. All right, I virtually unplugged our second disk. We no longer need it. Let's load the monitor up. This monitor, as you can tell, is at 8,000 hex or 32768 in decimal. So you can see the status registers, the accumulator, the X register, the Y register, and the stack pointer. Uh, kind of neat. But we're going to load our program in by using the L command. And this is going to load that into memory. So now if we disassemble the first um, block of our code, we, we will see our code as the machine built it. Now we were using macros, but here you can clearly see the macros expanded out. You could see the border color set, the screen color being set, uh, et cetera. You notice as I press down, it just keeps going to the next spot of memory, which is super useful. So we're looking for where our program pretty much ends, and it looks like this is where our code ends. There's our RTS. So most likely this is going to be the text um, behind it. Um, so kind of looking at this code, we can tell that this is where it's trying to set the zero um, five times, and that's at 1042. So let's inspect that memory before we run our program. We can do it with the I key. So inspect 1042, and we'll go to like, I don't know, 1060. And here we can clearly see our 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. When we run this, which we will, it's going to drop us back to basic. So we're going to assist 32768 to get back into the monitor. If I run that command again, we should see five zeros, which we do, and then six, seven, eight, nine, which is the other memory unaltered. So I would consider this a successful test. And now we're done writing our macros. So let's go update our project plan. All right. Okay, so we've created our custom version of Tomaco Pro. We've created a delay routine. We created our common macros. Whoops. Okay, we've created poke. We created print text, and we created our set mem. So next, we're going to write sound routines. Let's save our notes. And let's get to Turbo Macro Pro and work on our sound routines. All right, so we're going to create some sound routines. Before we get started, let me just make sure that you're aware that I have about 48 hours of experience playing with the SID chip on a Commodore 64. So as you can imagine, uh, my breadth of knowledge is pretty shallow. But with the Commodore 64 user's guide and programmer's reference, there was a really clear example of how to produce simple sounds. And that's all we really need for our first game ever, right? Because we need to use macros in this file, we need to bring up common and export the macros. So first we'll load in the common file.
these are the macros that we want to export. So we're going to do a left arrow MS to start marking text. We're going to come down right before the test code here, do a left arrow mark end, and then a left arrow B for block and write. And we're going to call this common.m. All right, and then we're going to cold start the editor and create our sound file. So we use left arrow C and yes. So we're going to do a back arrow too. And this is going to be a file called sound. And if you remember from before, the program that we're going to create here is our test code. And then the bottom part of it is going to contain our subroutines that we're going to export out to a sound as file that can be brought into our main game code later. So let's start with an origin of a thousand. And we're going to include our macros. And we do that by doing a dot include common dot m. Just to get started, we'll have an RTS. All right. So this should uh, assemble. And this tells us that our macro file is good. All right. So let's create some sound routines. So we'll start a new section here. And this section will be called sound.s. All right. So these are going to be our sound routines. And just to take a step back, the SID chip. Everything you need to control it are controlled through 24 bytes of memory in registers at memory address D400 through D418. The first thing I'm going to create is a routine to initialize the sound. And it's not too far of a stretch to think we're going to need a routine to play a sound. And since that will start a sound, we're going to need a routine to stop the sound. So of course we're going to start with init sound. All right. The first thing we need to do is set the block of memory from D400 to D418 with zeros. And we can use our setMem macro to do that. So we're going to do setMem, D400, we're going to set it to zeros, and we want to do 24 locations. So that's going to completely uh, prepare our SID chip and turn everything off. There's no volume. It's, just, it's ready to roll. So, okay, so from here, we're going to set our volume to full blast. And we do that by uh, putting in D400 plus 24 a 15. This particular memory location does more than control the volume, uh, but the volume part of it is the first four bits. So we're going to set those all to ones, and that is where the 15 is. So we're only going to be using voice one. So we're going to set up an ADSR envelope on voice one. Uh, what an envelope is on a voice is it's a kind of a, a shape of how the sound is played. Uh, there's an attack, a decay, a sustain, and a release portion of it don't quite understand it too well, but conceptually it makes sense. Um, in the basic program, I played around with some values and I came up with these two numbers that work really well. And they look like this. So we're going to set the attack and decay on voice one to 34. Now, each part of this is four bits, right? So, so this basically equals each value being set to two. And then we're going to set the sustain and the release to 128 comment here and these are also stored as two four bit values so we're setting our release to zero and our sustain to the value eight and then we're going to have an rts to return from subroutine so this will initialize our sound card and set up the adsr envelope on voice one and set the volume for all channels if, uh, to full my understanding of the volume is there's only one volume control for all three voices let's make sure this assembles and it does and in our test code here, we're just going to call it JSR init sound. Okay. Make sure that assembles again. Excellent. And before we run it, we want to save it. Now, since all this does is set up our sound chip, what we're expecting when we run this is nothing to happen. Uh, what we don't want to have happen is our machine to crash. So let's give this a run. So I think that's a good sign. So now let's do the exciting part, play sound, because this is what's really all about. So the play sound routine, the way I'm visualizing this is going to work, is we're going to pass in a sound into the accumulator of value between 0 and 4. All right. 0 is going to be our fail sound. And then um, 1 will be blue. Actually, let's do this. 1 will be blue. 2 will be yellow. 3 will be red. Four will be green. So if we were to give each sound a color, those would be the colors. So let's create this um, this routine. 
So we're going to play sounds like musical instruments, right? Uh, and each sound has a frequency, and a frequency is expressed on a SID chip as a integer value, a two-byte uh, value. In the back of the program's reference guide, luckily, there's a chart of frequency to musical sounds and octaves, which was, which was great. So I went on to Wikipedia, and I looked up the game that I'm uh, heavily inspiring this from, <laughs> and was able to find the notes that make up the sounds, and then using the reference guide, we're able to create this table. So what we're going to do is we're going to create uh, a label here called notes, and we're going to insert into this position the sound. So the very first sound we're going to create is our fail sound, okay? The second note we're going to create is the G, which is our blue sound. All right, I'll put a little comment here for blue. This is going to be our fail sound. When we play a sound on the SID chip, we can make it sound differently by choosing a waveform. And the two waveforms that I came up with was the noise generator, which, which is a great fail sound, just like static noise, and then one called triangle, which had a, a pretty nice sound to it. So we're going to create a waveforms label, all right? and we're going to assign a waveform for each sound number. So for the fail, it's going to get 129, and then to get triangles for the other four, it's going to get 17s. Let me just explain why they're, the numbers are 129 and 17. To play a sound, you have to set a bit that is the waveform. Then you set the first bit, bit 1, to turn it on. So that's why these all have odd numbers. And you set the first bit to 0 to turn it off. Thus, we can just decrement these numbers by 1 to turn it off. Um, and then what we need to have here is a little variable that we're going to come back to, which is the current waveform this, that is playing. So when we play a sound, we're going to look up the frequency and the waveform for the value passing accumulator and set those. The reason why we have a waveform out here is so when we call the stop sound, we can turn that waveform sounds off. Okay, so we're going to kind of put an RTS here to signal where our code is going to end. Uh, we want to preserve the accumulator because we're going to need that later. So we're going to push it onto the stack for a moment and then we'll pull it off the stack. We're going to transfer the accumulator to the X register because we're going to look up our waveform with this. So now we're going to load into the accumulator from our waveforms table X. So what that's going to do is look up this value, all right, depending on the value in the accumulator. So if I pass in a 1, I'll get a 17. If I pass in a 0, I'll get this 129. We're going to store this value in waveform. And that's, the, that's this byte down here. This way we can turn it off later. Because each note is described pair of values to form a frequency, we need to multiply the accumulator by two to figure out where in the table we're going to read from. And we do that by using the arithmetic shift left command. All right, That's going to take the accumulator, shift it all the bits to the left one, effectively doubling the number. And now we have the offset into this table that we need to get. So for example, if I were to have a zero, bit shift left zero, zero, so it'll grab the first one. One times two is two, we'll grab this one. Two times two is four, right? So zero, one, two, three, four, we'll grab these two. All right, so now we have our accumulator with the offset. Now we need to transfer the accumulator to the X index register so we can use it uh, to look up the frequency. So now we're gonna load, so then we're gonna load the accumulator with notes x and this is the high the high byte of the frequency okay so that that first number there is the eight for example then we're going to store that in d400 plus one that is the memory address for the first voice where we put the high value of the frequency and then we're going to load in oops this is supposed to be notes and then we're going to load in notes plus one comma x to grab the low frequency all right so notes plus one would start here and this would give us the second value we're going to store that into d400 and that is where the low byte goes now we're going to load into the accumulator the waveform that's the value we tucked away over here okay and then we're going to store that into memory address d400 plus four this address sets the waveform and as we mentioned earlier that first bit We'll also turn a sound on. So this will give us sound. So now we need to, to test this out. 
So let's load into the accumulator a zero. That's the white noise sound. Then let's call our play sound function. So let's assemble this. Okay, let's save it. Let's run it. And we have our static sound. Excellent. So now let's load in uh, a one. We should have uh, um, a triangle sound. And we do. All right, we're off to a good start. So now we're going to need a way to turn the sound off. So this routine is going to be called stop sound. Uh, the very first thing you want to do is take the value in a waveform uh, and decrement it by one. That's going to remove the first bit. Keep the waveform the way it is, but remove the first bit. So this way we have a zero in that first position. We're going to load that value into the accumulator, and then we're going to store it at D400 plus four. And this will turn off the sound. All right. So to test this uh, very easily, so we can introduce a quick command here to scan the keyboard after the sound plays. Then we would press a button and then that would turn the sound off. Create a little wait key loop here. We're going to JSR into FFE4. And FFE4 is a kernel command. I'm going to check if someone pressed the key. If someone did press a key, it's going to load that value into the accumulator. A zero implies that no key was pressed. And if a zero is loaded to the accumulator, it sets our zero flag. So we can use our branch if zero flag is set to wait key. So this will effectively wait for key to be pressed. And then we can call stop sound. So let's save this. Okay. Let's assemble it. Let's drop to basic and run it. There's our sound and our sound turns off off to a good start here. Okay, so we're going to change our test code to play each sound, wait for a key, and then play the next sound. And then once we've played all the sounds, it will stop. This way we can test that each one of our sounds works. So we're going to load into the index register of five, because we're going to do a loop here five times. We'll call this label test loop. We're going to decrease the value of the X register by one, so that five will become a four. We're going to transfer the X into the accumulator then we're going to push that accumulator onto the stack because we're going to want to pull that back off so we can continue our loop, right? And that accumulator is the sound we're going to play. So it's going to play the sounds, uh, the triangles first, going in descending order, and then play the, the white noise. Right. So then the sound plays. It waits for a key. It stops it. Then we're going to pull that the accumulator off the stack so we get the four back so then from there we can transfer that back into the x register and what happens is when you transfer back to the x register when you transfer the accumulator back into the x register there's the possibility that it could set the zero flag so if it's not zero meaning we haven't played the last sound we want to go back up to test lp so we want to branch if the zero flag is not set back to the loop if the zero flag was set, and this is the last sound, our program is going to finish. All right, so let's give this a test. All right, let's save it first. And let's give this a run. Excellent. So I think we've got some good sound routines here. And we've created an init sound, a play sound, and a stop sound. Let's go update our notes. So we, so we wrote some sound routines. And let's just kind of expand on what we've created here. We created an init sound. We've created a play sound. And we've created a stop sound. All right, our project's looking pretty good. All right, let's save this up and let's get started on some game state routines.
One of the things that we need for our game state is the ability to generate random numbers so we can build our random pattern for the player to play against. After doing some reading, it turns out the SID chip is a pretty good source of random numbers. So we're going to go back into our sound code and create a random number generator based off the SID chip. So the way it works, from what I understand, is that we're going to take the third voice of our SID chip, set it to the noise generator, set the frequency to maximum volume. But what's interesting is you don't have to turn the sound on to pull random numbers out of it. Just having the waveform and a frequency set to it with the sound turned off is enough to generate random numbers. So let's give this a try. To do this in our init sound routine, I'm going to add a couple lines of code here. So here we're going to set up our noise generator. These two addresses correspond to the 16-bit value that's used for the frequency. And we're just going to blast it with all ones or 255s. This line here selects the waveform for voice three, but leaves it turned off. So at this point, in theory, random numbers are being generated, or at least pseudo random numbers. I'm sure there's some debate over if they're truly random or not. All right, let's write a routine to pull a random number out of it. Let's put it, yeah, we'll put it at the bottom here. So we're gonna make a function called rand, rnd color, all right? And we're gonna return in the accumulator a value between one and four, that's our, our colors. We don't wanna return zero, that's our fail number. By loading the accumulator with memory just D41B, that should pull a number uh, off of the oscillator, I guess, that's a random number between uh, zero and 255. Now, we only need a number between one and four. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna mask off everything but the first two bits. So by ending it with a three, we're just keeping bits zero and one. So now we have a value between one and three, and then we're just gonna add one to that, and now we have a value between one and four. And of course, to add a number, we're clearing the carry. So when we add with the accumulator the value one, we're not accidentally bringing in a, a number from a previous edition. So um, how could we test this random number? Well, we want to output a random number uh, while our sound is playing. So what we'll do here is we'll do a JSR to RND color. This will store the value between one and four in the accumulator. And then we're going to store this on the screen at 0400. So it's the first thing that we'll see in the top left corner of the screen. One, two, three, and four correspond to A, B, C, and D when we store that onto the screen. So every time we run this, we should see four random values between A and D. So let's give this a shot. We saw a C and an A there. There's a D. Let's see if we can get a B. Uh, there's our B. Okay, that seems sufficiently random from what we're looking for. The last thing we want to do is we want to export all these routines to sound.s so we can use it in our game state routines. So we'll do our usual left arrow MS to start marking the text. Jump to the very bottom here and mark end command block right, and this is going to go out to sound.s. All right, let's do some game suit routines. All right, now we're going to write the game state. This is going to be kind of the heart of the, uh, of the game. Uh, this is going to track the pattern that the player has to play, where we are in a pattern, what player is, is um, trying to repeat it, that kind of stuff. Let's get started with just the shell. So we're going to call this game state. All right. And this will be our, our test code for the game state. It's going to start at 1,000, as always. So we need a couple things to write this. We need our macros, and we need some subroutines. So we're gonna bring in sound.s, because that's what our random number generator is, 
and we're going to bring in delay.s. That's the routine we need to pause while we're playing sounds. All right. All right. So what we're going to need is a, a byte of memory to track which round we're in. All right. We're going to need a block of memory to track uh, the, the musical notes that are the game. And I think 20 is a good maximum. So let's do 10 on this line and then 10 on this line. And then we're going to want another little block of memory to keep track of where we are in a round when the player is echoing back the sounds. I'm going to call that round pass, round position. So we're going to need a function to get things started for a game. So we're going to create one here called init game. All right, so we're going to do a block. All right, and I always kind of just throw an RTS in just to make sure I don't forget. So when this code's done, it goes back. All right, so we're going to we're going to set the pattern uh, with 20 zeros. This seems kind of silly since we're about to fill it with random numbers, but I don't know, it's a habit that I have. We don't really need that line of code. We're going to set the round to one, right? Because the game is starting and we want to start the first round. And now we need to go fill in 20 random numbers into our pattern. So we're going to track that count from one to 20 with our X index register. We're going to set up a loop. And we're going to load into the accumulator a two and call our subroutine to delay. And that's going to delay two sixteenths of a second. I'm not sure what the proper number here is, but this seems to work pretty well. Um, before we pull in a random uh, number off of the SID chip, we want to wait a little bit for the sound to change. Uh, this amount is probably really long, but it works. We're going to call our RND color routine. And if you remember, that puts it to the accumulator of value between 1 and 4. That's our random note for the pattern. And then we're going to store that um, in this pattern block of bytes here, index by x. And the first round is 0, so the that first 0 becomes whatever random number we get. We'll say 2. Uh, we're going to increment the x register. We're going to compare the x register to 20 because we want to fill this with 20 patterns. Um, and if they are equal, the zero status flag is set. If we're not done um, looping, if we're not at 20 yet, we want to branch to the loop. Okay, so now we've assigned 20 random numbers to our pattern and we want to load into the accumulator zero and store that into the round position. Oops, you want to store that into the round Position. There we go. Um, now, even though it's initialized to zero, we're doing this in case someone has a second game they're going to start. We want to make sure that we completely reset these values to put our new game in a good state. All right, so let's see if this assembles first of all. Make sure we have good code. Excellent assembles. Let's save this. All right, so let's add to our test code here. So, you would think we would just call uh, init game, which is true. We do need that to initialize our game, but we do need to init sound first. That's that routine we created that sets up the random number generator and got the voice ready and set the, the frequency and, and all that stuff. We want to call it before we do anything. Then we're going to initialize our game. And if all goes well, when I assemble this and run it, nothing should happen. Just a tiny bit of a pause, nothing happened. That's a good thing. So the reason why I paused when we ran it was our code that creates our pattern has a little delay in between each random node it creates to make sure it gets a good random value. And that pause is so insignificant, no one's really gonna notice. All right, let's jump back into the editor. All right, so we're still not sure if it's completely working, we're pretty sure, but it didn't crash, so we're off to a good start. Uh, but we do need a routine here that's going to play the pattern for the current round we're in. So we're going to come down here and we're going to create uh, a, a play pattern uh, subroutine. So I'll put a little comment here. And this is going to be play pattern. So what this function is going to do is play all the notes up to the round we're in to the player. So the first thing we want to do is delay about a quarter of a second. And we do that by loading a 15 to the accumulator and calling our delay subroutine. And again, that's 15 sixteenths of a second, which is a quarter of a second. All right, now we want to loop through 
up to the round we're in, um, pull the pattern note in and play it for the player. So we're going to use the X index register to, to loop through the pattern. Let me just kind of push the pattern here up. There we go. So we're going to start a loop. We're going to move that value in, from the X register into the accumulator because we're going to need that in a moment. And then we're going to push it onto the stack. And we're going to come back to that because we're going to need that value back. But we're going to do a whole bunch of other things that we need the accumulator for. So we're going to load into the accumulator the first note in the pattern. And it starts at zero. So we're going to get whatever number was created by the init game function. All right. Now we're going to jump to our subroutine to play the sound. And again, that play sound takes the number in accumulator and uses that to pick the note and play. And it starts the sound. So now we want to wait about a half a second. And we do that by loading 30 into the accumulator and calling our delay function. Once that delay is done, we're going to call stop SND to stop the sound from playing. And then we're going to load in a 15 so we can pause for a quarter of a second between each note that's played. So now that we've done that work, let's pull the accumulator back off the stack. So at this point, it's still zero. We're going to transfer that accumulator value back into the X index register. We're going to increase the X index register by one. So it goes from zero to one. And then we're going to compare this number to the round that we're in. That's the value here. So round was initialized to one. We've played one note. The new value in the X index register is one. So it would be done for the first round. If that comparison is equal, it sets the zero flag. Uh, if it's not equal, the zero flag is not set and we can branch to loop. So this will play the notes in the pattern. All right, all right. So let's jump up here. And let's call it. Right. So uh, let's save this. Let's assemble it. All right. And now let's uh, run it. If all goes well, we'll hear one note. And it'll be a random note. Excellent. We heard one note because we're in the first round. Only one note to play. We run us again. We should hopefully hear a different note. Uh, let's see. How about a third time? There we go. So that seems to be working. Um, but we want to hear more from our test routine. So let's tell the test code that we're on round five. All right. Assemble this. All right, we should hear five random notes. That was pretty good. And let's try it again, see if we get a different pattern. Fantastic. So let's save this once again. And then we need to export the subroutines to its own file. So to do that, oh, we need to separate this up a bit. So let's put a separator here. This is where the game state subroutines start. All right. All right, so uh, left arrow MS to start the marking. We'll drop to the very bottom here. Mark the end, block right, and this will go to game state dot S. And that's going to be the file that we include into our game. All right, let's go write the actual game. All right, we've got our sound. We've got our game state. Um, we've got some delay routines. Uh, let's write the core game logic. So we're going to call this copycat. All right. Uh, start at dollar one thousand, and we need to bring some of our code in. We're going to need our macros. We're going to need our sound routines. We're going to need our delay routines, and we're going to need our game state. All right, so this is going to be the shell of it. Let's make sure this at least assembles. Excellent, and we're just gonna do an initial save. All right, so if you remember from our test code, 
uh, we need to call our subroutine to initialize the sound. That initializes the sound, of course, for random number generation and uh, our fail sound and our, and our main game sound. We're going to call init game to initialize the game. And at this point, we're ready for the first round. So we're going to create an RND loop. This is going to be a label that's the that's going to be a loop for us playing one round of copycat. So we're going to make a call to play pattern. B network in round one. This will start by playing one note to our player, and then they have to uh, echo it back to us. So we're going to do a wait key loop. This is another loop or an inner loop where we're going to wait for the player to press a key, and we're going to call. Um, the kernel routine FFE4 to pull a key out of the keyboard buffer. And I will put, of course, the value of that key into the accumulator. If they haven't pressed a key, it'll be uh, the zero flag will be set because the accumulator was loaded with a zero and we will loop back to wait key. So that's branch on the, uh, the zero state uh, being set to one. All right, so they're gonna press a key. So we're expecting them to press the number keys, one, two, three, and four, all right? So um, press keys one to four. The ASCII value of a one is 49. So we want to turn that into a number one through four that we can use in our routines. So what we're going to do is we're going to subtract 48 from that. So what we do is we, we, uh, we're going to set the carry flag, which seems kind of counterintuitive to how subtraction works, but in subtraction, you set the carry flag so we don't borrow one by accident. Uh, and then we're gonna subtract 48. So now the accumulator holds the number one through four. Let's load the index register with a memory in the location of round pass. And if you remember, round pass is the position within a round uh, that we're comparing at the moment. So if, our, if we were in round five, and these were the values around five, when we're in uh, position zero, the user has to press a one for it to be correct. Then when we move to the next position, they would have to press a four. And then eventually, if they get all of them right, we'll move on to the next round. So that's what we're, look that's what we're putting into the X uh, uh, index register. The accumulator has the value that they typed in, the one. We're gonna compare pattern index by X by the round position with the accumulator to see if it matches. If it matches, it'll set the zero flag and we can branch with a zero flag is set to what we're gonna call a good key. And we're gonna write that in just a moment. So that means they got it right. Well, if they didn't get it right, they must've gotten it wrong. So we're gonna call this a bad key. So let's pretend for a moment when the first round, the correct answer is one. They press two and it's wrong. That's where this piece of code comes in. So we're gonna play the sound that they typed in so they can hear the wrong note that they picked. And we're gonna let that play for half a second. All right, and then we're gonna stop that sound. All right, then we're gonna delay uh, 10 over 60 of a second, so it's a one sixth of a second. We're gonna delay that. So there's a little gap between the sound that they played wrong. And now we're gonna play the fail sound. And we do that by loading a zero to the accumulator and calling play sound. And of course that plays that white noise. And we're gonna let that one sit for three quarters of a second. All right, so we're gonna delay that. And then we're going to uh, stop that sound. And then we're gonna jump over to game over because they've lost. So that's what happens when you type the wrong key in. Now what happens if I type in the correct key? Well, we're jumping down here to good key. So we're gonna make a good key label. You wanna play the sound that they just keyed in so they can hear the correct sound. And then we're gonna have a delay, so it plays for a little bit. We're gonna stop the sound, okay? And then we're gonna move the round position up one value, All right? So in a one round game, which is the first round, it'll go from zero to one. So now we, load, we need to load into the accumulator the round that we're on, which when we start the game is round one. So these two will equal at this point. So we're gonna compare the memory address in round pass Right, with the round that we're in, which is an accumulator. If they're the same, we're gonna to branch to a label called go next round. If there is more to do in this round, another, you know, we're in round three and they haven't typed in all the keys yet, we need to jump back to wait key. And wait key is all the way up here. So this will continue uh, the loop until they get all the keys pressed. 
Okay. There's another label we need here called go next round. So they've gotten all the notes correct for this round. So we need to increment the round by one. So it'll go from one to two. Now we're in a second round, all right? We're gonna poke the round position with zero. We're gonna reset that back to the start. So it plays the first note and the second note, right? And then we're gonna jump to the round loop. And that keeps the game, keeps the game going. And then before, if you remember up here, we jump to game over where the game is gonna end. And we're just gonna create a game over label here. And this label at the moment is gonna be very simple. It's just RTS and there's our RTS there. So this is the main game court logic, not a whole lot to it. So let's uh, see if this assembles first. So there's no errors in assembly. We wanna save it before we run it. All right, let's uh, drop to basic and let's give it a run and see how well our main game loop works. So let's see, I'm gonna get it wrong. Awesome, so you heard the fit, you heard the, uh, the wrong note, you heard the static noise and the game ended. Let's see if I can get this to go a round or two. Nope, <laughs> let's try that again. We got pretty far in it. So now we have our core game logic. Uh, let's go update our notes and figure out what to do next. All right, so we're gonna fill in some blanks here. We wrote some, uh, some game state routines. All right, so we had a routine to play the pattern of notes back to the player. Uh, we had a, a routine to uh, initialize the game. And then up here in the sound routines, we ended up adding a routine to generate random numbers for us. All right. And then we wrote the, uh, the core gameplay logic. So it plays 20 rounds of uh, sound only gameplay at the moment. So clearly there's a couple of things we need to work on. So things we need to work on. Um, what happens at 20 rounds? We'll have to figure that out. We're going to need some visualization. So we need to figure what that's going to look like. We're going to need to calculate and display a score. And cool. So I think those are pretty good things to work on next. So stay tuned for uh, the next video where we tack those. But I think we're off to a really great start here. We got the core uh, logic of our game. I'm excited to see what we can do next with it. See you next video.